This series is called Who I Am. It's another important identity message. It clashes with the ways of the world. It's the unique uh, understanding of what it is to be a follower of Christ. And the question here this morning is a little different. Who is your representative? We're going to take a slightly different angle as the Scripture takes us into the story of the first Adam and the second Adam. And though the story might seem complicated at first, it's actually very, very simple. It's about the influence of two key individuals. So Romans 5 verse 12, let's read, therefore, obviously that refers to what we've already studied so far, and you can stay in touch with all the messages that we've done on podcasts and YouTube and Facebook and all that kind of thing. Let's read on verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. Put your hands up if that would include you. Should be everybody right now. All people, because all sinned. And there's a digression, verse 13, to be sure. Sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is the pattern of the one to come. But the gift, and of course that's Jesus, and that word gift is used a lot in this passage, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Say amen to that. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act, that's the cross, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Two more verses. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. We'll explain that later. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And to the reading of God's word, let everybody say... Amen. So here's my question. Who's your representative? And when I first asked that word, you might think of a local politician or someone in school or someone at work or whatever, but we're clearly asking a different question. Who's the dominant influence in your life? Is there one personality who really shapes or defines you? Maybe your parents or your grandparents or your, your, um, your uh, brother or your sister. It may be uh, even an auntie or an uncle. Now, those are the people that you didn't choose to be around you. It could be your spouse. That, by the way, is the one that you did choose. So you got some responsibility in that one. The big influence in your life may be a hero. <clears throat> could be a historical figure, a pastor or a student pastor. Uh, it could be an older Christian. Is there someone that you look up to? Now, here's another angle. Is there someone who has a grip on you in a negative way? We did a series about a year ago called Toxic. Is there someone who kind of has a toxic influence in your life? Maybe your parents say, when you hang out with them, they, that just drags you down and you do stuff you wouldn't do on your own. Is there something that's got a grip on you? Well, this passage is about two individuals and about two themes. Let's lay it out simply. It's about Adam and it's about Jesus, the second Adam. Let me say this. These are the most influential men in human history, according to Romans 5. It's not a politician. It's not a king or an emperor. It's not Steve Jobs or even Taylor Swift. But it's Adam and Jesus, the second Adam, are the most influential people in your life and in human history. We don't always think about it 
in that way, but let me tell you it's the truth. Now, we first read about Adam in the book of Genesis, the book of Origins. We believe that the Bible is true and that the record is accurate. Jesus quoted from each of the first five Bible books called the Pentateuch, that means the five, including Genesis. Jesus teaches about Adam and Eve, especially from the point of view of creation. And when people say, well, Jesus never spoke about the identity issues of our time, he absolutely did because when he covered the story of Adam and Eve and creation, he covers it just about all. We believe that God created the world according to the book of Genesis. We're a Bible-believing church. And yet the world, when it doesn't want to believe, puts its hands over its ears and just shouts louder. Pontius Pilate asked the crowd, what crime has Jesus committed? You know, that was a legal question. What crime has he committed? And what was the response? Crucify him. That was not an intelligent answer to a legal question, but that's the way it goes today as well. They don't answer the question, they just shout louder. People will evade the truth with violent speech. Can you see this pattern occurring all through our society and world? By the way, if a story or the science is true, it shouldn't be afraid to stand up to scrutiny. It doesn't need a mob or to glue yourself to the road to prove it. That's not science. How dare you is not a scientific statement. The Bible shows us that we came from one man and one woman. We are of the same blood. And interestingly, scientifically, recent discovery proves that we are 99.8% all of us the same DNA, the same blood. There is no difference. A right view of creation unites us. That's why Galatians 3.28 says, there is no difference. Through creation and through the cross, we are one in Christ today, so let not man separate us. We thank God that he has joined us as his people, and someone's got to praise the Lord because of that truth. Three people. Come on. We are, we are one, my friends. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so, Paul declares his hand. Now think about it. Paul is known as a great scholar. The way he writes the book of Romans stands out to us. This is a magisterial epistle, one of the most influential writings in human history. He was perhaps at the time the widest traveled man of the day, probably speaking to more people than anyone had spoken to in his time. He observed and interacted in the centers of Greek philosophy. Paul believed in Adam, as did Jesus, and when he goes to Athens, the center of all that philosophy, in Acts chapter 17, do you know what his first big point was? From Acts 17, he says, from one man, he made all the nations. The apostle Paul, the great intellectual, actually began with Adam. I'm not ashamed of the word of God. I don't need to defend the word of God because the word of God is true. You and I came from one man and one woman. Jesus and Paul explained about Adam and Eve from the point of creation. And there's something else that the story of Adam shows us as well. Notice in Romans 5, first of all, Adam is the originator of sin, the representative of the human race, and these are my words, who messes things up. Look again at verse 12, therefore just as sin entered, say entered, sin entered through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Look at verse 14, again about half of the passage is about the effects of Adam, Half of the passage is about the effects of Jesus, the second Adam. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam. He is the originator of sin. Verse 17, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. Verse 18, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation of all people. Verse 19, through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. Secondly, his influence brought in death. That's quite a lot to have on your shoulders, isn't it? That's quite an epitaph, very sadly, but it's the simple fact Adam brought in sin. The point, though, of original sin is that it's also on our shoulders as well. We simply cannot separate ourselves from the story of Adam. He begins it, but we are part of the story as well. Uh, this is all about the fact that you and I perpetuate this sin. 
Adam is the representative of the entire human race up till this point of reading the scripture. We would say he's the biggest influence in our life. He started it. He's more than the poster child. Uh, he's more than and just an example of how to mess up your life. He's the originator. Thirdly, Adam has a representative impact upon every human being. When sin came into the world, it was irreversible. The cat came out the bag. The toothpaste was out the tube. The atom had been split. You cannot reverse that. And I say tube as opposed to tube, or whatever you say. Do you say it like that? I don't know how you say it. Fourthly, Adam's responsibility does not excuse us. We are all responsible for our own sin. The same devil who tempted Adam seeks to tempt everybody listening to this today. I, I came up with this phrase. I don't know if you like it, but sinning leads to sin and sin leads to sinning. I thought that was genius, by the way. I thought you would like that. Somehow, I don't think that one's going to travel across the world as, as a famous quote or anything. But if there's an equivalent chapter in uh, the Old Testament, it's Ezekiel chapter 18, equally a magnificent logic uh, where, whereby we, we simply cannot escape the truth of God. And I want us to look at Ezekiel 18 on the screen right now. This is very, very similar, almost like a Romans 5 in the Old Testament. The one who sins is the one who will die. So we're almost moving from Adam's original sin to our sin. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent. That's a, that's a, that's a kind of justice statement, isn't it, everybody? The child, the child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. Amen? The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So let me comment on this. God will not punish you for somebody else's sin. The scripture is so clear. In the realm of human justice, you must not be punished for somebody else's sin. You are not responsible for the sin of your forefathers. Adam was responsible for his sin, you for your sin, and me for mine. Actually, life's hard enough dealing with our own sin, let alone having everybody else's sin placed upon us as well. That was nothing to do with you. A husband may have been a complete disaster, but just because the son looks like the foolish father doesn't mean that you've got to be mean to the son because he had a bad father. Amen? You're not guilty because of your nationality, and people will try and lump that one on you. You're not guilty because of your forefathers or because of your skin color. That's nationalism, generationalism, and racism. People will try to punish you or diminish you because of somebody else's sin or misfortune. I shared at the marriage conference, which was a wonderful success this weekend. We're so encouraged by that. I shared that my wife, Louise, who's not well right now, but listening to us right now, Louise is a daughter of divorce, and I'm a son of suicide. And there may, may be someone here, your parent went to prison, but can I just tell you, my friend, that sin is not on you. The scripture is very clear about that. Now, I have to confess my own sin. I've needed to repent of my own sin, and we must confess our own sin. Can you see how messed up our culture is when we stray away from the Word of God? Look at verse 21. But, this is the encouragement, if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. Repentance is a sweet thing. I cannot repent for your sin or my father's sin or my predecessor's sin, but I can repent of my sin today. If your adult child sins, they have to deal with that. You are not responsible for, your, for the sins of your adult child. I'm not saying that you won't be affected by someone else's sin. We've all been affected by the sin of Adam. We've all been affected by other people's sins around us all the time, but you're not responsible for their sins. Say an amen to that. This is the truth of the Word of God. One of the foolish things of the day is for one tribe to hate another tribe because something that happened in the past. How foolish that is. I grew up in a guest house in the United Kingdom. When my dad died, my mum was a cordon bleu chef like French cooking, and so she used to teach uh, cookery uh, in the evenings, and in the daytime, she ran the guest house. Uh, if you've seen the movie Nanny McPhee, it was a little bit like that. We had this <clears throat> old Victorian house with a leaky roof, and so I basically grew up with students around me all the time. I grew up with Italians. Perhaps that explains something. Uh, I grew up with the Spanish. I grew up with French. 
We had Africans staying with us. We had the nations uh, come and stay with us. And one day, the story, I heard the story that we were going to have a German come and live with us. Now, of course, only 30, I've told you this story before, only 30 years before, our countries had been at war. I mean, my hometown, 10% of the houses uh, in, in my hometown were damaged or destroyed by Hitler's bombs. And no doubt, he had his story as well and his own experience of that, but a German was coming to town and staying with us. And so I'd got all those stereotypes, and we were trying to, you know, by, in those days, by the late 70s, you're trying to kind of move on from there. But the stereotypes, of course, was that the Germans have no sense of humor, uh, and you'd say things like, uh, you know, I'm just pulling your leg, but you are not pulling my leg. And so we had all these stereotypes. But then so Dieter comes along. And let me tell you, he was the funniest of the lot. He was funnier than any of us, even the Italians. And we loved Dieter. He was just such a great guy. And he uh, was just a real picture to me. How foolish for one tribe to hate another tribe because something that had happened even in recent history, let alone ancient history history, once the issues was Americans and Japanese, and we had to learn how to, to work through that and in time become friends. And how about mentioning black or white in the southern states of the United States? Even though we have 99.8% of DNA, did I tell you that? How foolish we can be, how foolish we have been. Let me mention the most terrible division of all, Georgia or Alabama. Or Alabama or Auburn. And let's not argue about who has the greatest rivalry. But do you agree with me according to Romans 5 and Ezekiel 18? We cannot repent of sins that you didn't commit. You can't do anything about that. We must repent of the sins that we have committed. I believe that very often by blaming the past or blaming them or going against that tribe, that's our very poor excuse of refusing to repent of our own sins. That's the greatest sin of all. When we, I believe that the blasphemy, against of the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not so much about uttering a certain set of words, but it's an essentially a determination to resist the Holy Spirit and not repent and not get right with God. What a dangerous place to be. So when people load something on you, they've got the problem. You can only repent of that which comes from true conviction of the Holy Spirit. I tell you what, God's people, we need discernment in this day and age. When is someone just loading guilt on you? And when is that conviction of the Holy Spirit? Hey, haven't you learned to detect when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin? You're like, it's like, yeah, I know. And, and you're saying, sorry, Lord. And you're saying, thank you, Lord, really quickly. And, and if someone even lovingly, graciously points something out to you, you, often the Spirit of God's already working in our hearts. We're going, yeah, I'm on this. You know, d d don't drive this home. I got it already. Other times it's like, it hits us between the eyes. It's like, you're right. We, we learn to detect c conviction of the Holy Spirit. As to the psychological guilt that gets loaded upon us, do you know what you have to say to that? Get thee behind me, Satan. Ezekiel 18 verse 30 is a, an encouragement to us now. Therefore, you Israelites, I believe we can apply that in the new covenant. I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. What do we do about it, friends? Repent. Which means, of course, turn. There it is for us. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. This is the Old Testament sounding pretty New Testament, my friend. And of course, it's all one word of God. We're all responsible for our sin. But I've just got to remind us that we're coming to discuss the second Adam. He took our sins and our sorrows and made them our very own. If you turn to the Lord today, you are pronounced, verse 21, no longer under sin's reign. Turn to the Lord and be forgiven and forgive. Don't confess somebody else's sin or everybody else's sin like the Pharisees did. Confess your own sin like the tax collector who said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Don't falsely accuse somebody. Don't call people names. Don't joke or joke to your people about those people because in God's house we're all his people. We've agreed as a church there's going to be no division in 2024. Never compromise the freedom of the pulpit by telling the, telling the pastor who he needs to preach against. Watch out because he may be preaching against you, my friend. And I don't want to do that. Understand that we're all under the sin of Adam. We don't blame Adam. I'm telling you something, though. We do get him, though, don't we? When we see his story, don't we identify with it and identify with the temptation how it came actually 
with a beautiful woman alongside him as well. And how tempted they were to blame one and the other. We do understand. Confess your own sin today. Admit it. Repent. Two men, Adam, and secondly, Jesus, the second Adam. Now, you'll notice in verse 13, going back a step, spiritual history gets marked out with Adam, and then Moses is the next key moment as well. The sin of Adam and the law of Moses show us our need as uh, show us our need of a savior. Now, as you may have noticed, I'm doing a, a podcast these days called Real with Reese with Alex Edwards, and it's produced by Braxton Gibbs, who's our uh, North Campus superstar here. We love Braxton. Uh, he's the guy that brings the table on, and uh, we, he's just an outstanding leader. Thank you, Pastor Zeke, for bringing uh, another young man from Mississippi. What a blessing he is to us. And so he does the producing. So he's listened to the podcast with Daryl Strawberry and our own Lee Haney and Whitney and Don Boykin. We've had some amazing podcasts. This week we did one about Charles Spurgeon, who I believe is quoted more than Shakespeare today, one of the most quoted uh, believers in history. And you'll hear this pastor quote him quite often. And I was, I was really interested how our 21-year-old producer and our 33-year-old student pastor really leaned into this subject because it's quite a remarkable story. Braxton's saying, Pastor Zeke brought me in and I've got leadership over some young men in the church and everything, but Spurgeon was leading the largest church in the world at the same age. It's a remarkable story. This is what Spurgeon said about the law. Listen to this. The law stirs the mud at the bottom of the pool and proves how foul the waters are. The law compels the man to see the sin that dwells in him and it is a powerful tyrant over his nature. All this is with a view to his cure. God be thanked when the law so works as to take the sinner away from all confidence in himself. Adam condemns us. The law convicts us. Jesus, the second representative, the second Adam, saves us. We've seen half the reading describing the impact of the enormous global influence Adam has had over every one of us. Let's rejoice now seeing what Jesus, the second Adam, has done for us by picking out some highlights, if I can put it that way. Verse 15, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Look at verse 17, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greatest representative of all. All through verse 18, one righteous act. Verse 19, so also through obedience to the one man, the many will be made righteous. You know when we used to play the card game whist, I don't know what you, you call it, or trumps, we would say that, that uh, one suit would trump over the other. And I was thinking like, I don't have to talk, use the word trump in church because someone's going to get mad at me or they're listening on the radio, they misunderstand me. So I mentioned this to my daughter, Ellen, and I said, give me a better word. She said, Dad, this one's easy. Eclipse. <laughs> Jesus eclipses everything, Amen. Uh, and, and let me tell you, who enjoyed the eclipse, by the way? Did you have some fun with the, the eclipse? Awesome. We, we, had a, we had a terrible time. We had a terrible, no, no as a staff, we, we, we did something really creative. We stood outside in the parking lot. We walked out of our executive team meeting, and there we were there. A couple of other guys joined us. We saw a couple of members who were walking by. Neil and Lynn joined us as well. And so we only had one pair of those silly glasses. Tim Woodruff had kept his from 2017. We're real cheapskates, you know. And so we're like, we're passing the glasses around. Like, we're looking at the eclipse. It's kind of slither of the sun and everything. And so it came and it went. But let me tell you, the eclipse of Jesus Christ lasts forever, forever, and, and glory be to him. Amen? And so what's the impact of Jesus Christ eclipsing, surpassing everything, overruling, yes, trumping over the sin of Adam? Jesus Christ is the one. And verse 20 and 21 says, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Where sin increases, grace increases. Uh, we have a ministry that comes to our church at the South Campus most weeks called Better Way Ministry. Uh, give me a wave if you know about Better Way. You see them, they're, they're the removal guys, and, and it's an, one of the great local ministries here started by our dear friend John Barrow, who spoke for our men's ministry the other day. A number of our new hopers are ministering during the week to the guys there. Anyway, they, there's usually about 12, 20 of those guys sat at the, the South Campus there. 
And uh, I use them as an illustration from time to time. And they say a hearty amen. I said, guys, some of you, the Bible says don't sin, but some of you have sinned. And we kind of know that story. And that's partly why you're in that situation of addiction right now. And so I say to you, you know, I say, you know, the Bible says do not sin. They all go like, amen. That's great. They're, they're really awesome like that. And then I said, uh, but here's the thing. Some of you may have sinned. And I, I use them as an illustration. You may have sinned. Sin may have abounded and increased in your life. But the wonderful thing is that you've come to an end of yourself and you realize that your only hope is Jesus Christ. There are many people in this world today, it's like because we're pretty respectable and we maybe seems externally like we don't do too much terrible stuff, we don't see our desperate need of grace increasing in our life even more. And I would just say those guys are a testimony of where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. I believe that Daryl Strawberry was an example and a witness. Not only did he speak for us four times quite brilliantly, but he's an example to us of where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And I want to encourage you, if you've fallen into a very dark and difficult place, you've got yourself into a a right old mess. Can I encourage you, my friend, today, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And let me tell you, friends, as well, don't sin. I encourage you not to sin. Let's live holy lives. But if on a particular day, Pastor Mike or dear brother Tony or sister Angela, there's just something and you go like, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. Lord, I'm so sorry. And, and there are some days that sort of hurts us a little bit more. On those days, we would exhort each other, don't do that. But if we do that, can I just encourage you, where sin has abounded, grace can abound even more because Jesus eclipses all. He surpasses all. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And someone's going to praise him one more time. Verse 20, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. That's the stirring of the pot. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Sin is powerful. Do you agree with me with that, everybody? All of us are responsible for our own sin. When we get that right, we get unity right. We understand relationships right. We understand our relationship with God's right? We're all responsible for our own sin, but let me tell you something. It's not enough just to say I'm responsible. We've got to repent of our sin as well. Amen. Everyone say repent. Sin is powerful, but grace is more powerful. Where sin has abounded and increased in our life, we turn to Christ and we discover something absolutely magnificent. Now, there are some people that want to reject Adam's influence over the world. I don't believe in Adam, and I don't accept his influence. Let me ask, do you want the influence of Jesus in your life? I don't want Adam to be my representative. Let me tell you, do you want Jesus to be your representative? If you can understand, my friend, that you are represented by Adam, first of all, it will make you all the more cry out and say, I need the second Adam. I need the most influential person in human history to take hold of me and forgive me my sins and set me free and help me to start all over again.